Transferring wealth successfully starts with asking yourself questions that will give your family a better life now and for generations to come. In this podcast, financial professionals John and Michael from Copper Beach Financial Group guide you through eye-opening questions to help you discover the truth about your wealth. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to The Truth About Wealth with John and Michael Paris of Copper Beach Financial Group. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Good morning, Eric. Hey, good morning, Eric. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Excellent. I, uh, you know, we, we had a nice little conversation before we started. We, you know, we're in the holiday season and it's been good so far. John, how's your back? Good. Good. Yeah. The, the, yeah everything's the, good. The crates, you anything? The, the crates of things that you're lifting aren't, aren't affecting you too badly. <laughs> no, my crates of wine down in my cellar. Yeah. Down this, <laughs> the steep flight of stairs. <laughs> yeah, right. I get ready for the holidays. You got some so, neighborhood kids. You can just, you know, you can pay a couple bucks to, right? You can just, yeah, we have, we have our Christmas party. So I, I nice. bring out all the good stuff. Yeah. 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 That, that's for awesome. My team. I got the best team. They deserve it. Well, so really what happens, Eric, is that he orders a lot of wine and in the summertime, it's too hot to ship it. So it sort of stockpiles until the summer is over. And then we just get this mad dash of wine in the, in the office that goes down in our cellar. So gotcha. we're in that time now. Yeah. The UPS guy wants to know who's the alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, oh yeah. I, I bet. And I hope he has a, a hand truck or something to, to oh, yeah. cart that yeah. around. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. All right. Besides wine. And I, we seem to talk about that a lot on this podcast. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, what are we talking about time. today? <laughs> Well, today, today's topic is going to be basically a question to you all. It's actually a question that is in our uh, white paper, which you can download from our website. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the 10 disturbing questions that oh. we have uh, in that white paper that families should be asking themselves about. But this question is, is your estate plan public or private? And that is going to be the topic of today's podcast. Yeah. And I, I know we've touched on this just briefly before, but I was really surprised. You know, I think that the, the major answer here is most people's is public. And I, I don't think most people think that, right. It's a, it's a private no. thing between my family. This is, this is, this is just us. Why would it be public? Yeah. And that's, that's what we're going to get into a little bit. And really this actually, even if a listener hasn't gone through this themselves, they've probably heard about it and it really comes up if you uh, have heard anything about most of the time, it's celebrities or other public figures, mm -hmm. and you read these news articles about what they left, whether it's, I think, the most recent ones that I read, like Prince, uh, when he passed away, you know, all of his estate plan is is a public, public information. Um, and that's really what we're going to talk about, because most of, to your point, Eric, a lot of our families, and when we go through our audit process, which is the initial stage um, of our process here at Copper Beach, we often find when we're reviewing estate plans that they're in the public domain. Um, and many of our, well, pretty much all of our families are either privately held business owners or are key people in their communities. And very often they're also private people. And so this topic of today's podcast is going to be really how do, why is their estate plan a public process? How do we avoid that? Uh, so that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Yeah, this is more like a fine tuning of your estate plan. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more detailed and more specific when you get into the privacy discussion. But Michael's correct that most people don't even know this is an option. They don't even understand what it means. So that's why we always have these lengthy conversation on that topic with, with families saying that we got to make these documents as private as possible to protect what you've created all your lifetime. Because there are a lot of people out there that have their eyes on wealthy people's monies and they're trying to figure out ways to either sue them or get information about them. So this is a conversation that's pretty deep with our clients because they have a tendency to be on the affluent side. Yeah. Michael, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Uh, uh -oh. as the, as the resident attorney, um, <laughs> why in the world is this information public with, with as much concern about identity theft and just people scamming other people? Um, there are a lot of bad folks out there. I'm sorry. They, they're just dirty, right? I mean, they're, they're just trying to get something that doesn't belong to them. Why, you know, from a legal standpoint, why are these things still public? Do, can, do you well, have an idea on that? Yeah. And, and the, the very simple reason is either a, the, the person who passes away, either a does not have a will or they have a will and they don't incorporate some trusts in their estate plan. And the reason why that is becomes a public document is called the it's called the probate process and so 
wills, as an example, are pretty interesting legal documents in that they actually don't take effect until the person has passed away. Mm -hmm. And since the person is no longer here to be able to enforce that document that is now a legal document, you will nominate someone in your will, which is called the executor, to essentially make sure that the terms of the will are satisfied. And that becomes a court supervised process called probate. And what every county has a surrogate uh, court in the United States. And what happens is when a person passes away, the executor will compile all the assets that the person owned in their probate estate, which we can uh, describe a little bit more if, you, if we're interested. And they will file that probate process with the court, and then that becomes public information. So anyone can go down and read a copy of your will. They can see what, what you left your mm. children. They could see if you've disinherited someone like a child. Uh, if that is a part of your estate plan. And they can also see how much assets you really had because that becomes a part of that probate process as well. So that's really where the public domain comes into play. So because it reached the court, right? I mean, that, that's the right. boiling it down. Our courts are transparent as, as much as we hope, at least we, we'd like them a little bit more, but they're transparent. So those types of documents are then public information. Wow. That's, that's scary. It is. Yeah. And, and again, if you think about a lot of the families that we work with and really it, 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 most families, I would think, would much prefer to have a privately administered um, probate process yeah. that keeps it out of that public domain. Also, when you look at the probate discussion we have with families, it becomes a management discussion as well, a management tool. The, the will can direct those assets to a trust. Michael brought it up a little while ago. And that's a management discussion. In other words, how do I manage the assets that I pass to my children, my family? Uh, this document can help us do that. So the discussion is not only how do we avoid the probate um, public issue, but also how do we manage the assets that you have accumulated mm -hmm. in a structure that allows families to have access to it, to, under to understand how it's going to be implemented from an income standpoint to them, or how much they get involved with that process on an ongoing basis. So it's also a very good management discussion as well mm -hmm. as a private and public discussion. And, and, and on top of that is really the, the length of the process because, you know, very often I've gone through this with a, a family member who passed away um, who was somewhat estranged uh, from the family for a, a little while, but um, she did nominate me as the executor of her estate. I wasn't working with her. Otherwise, I probably would have advised her to mm -hmm. not have her estate yeah. in this way. But she, she going through that probate process, I learned firsthand, and it's it depends on the state that you're in. Every state has different laws uh, around how the probate process works. But it's a time-consuming process, and it can be expensive because most families – you know, typically they will nominate a spouse or a family member to be the executor. Well, very often that person doesn't really have the expertise to really go through the probate process. And so they end up hiring an attorney to do that. And that can be an expense that the family doesn't have to bear in, in settling their estate because you can do it through other means and avoid that probate process entirely. Mm -hmm. So that's just another the expense of, of doing it is is another consideration that family should be aware of. Gotcha. Yeah. So that so, so that next step of the discussion is, well, how do you make it? How do you make it private? And when you when you start down that track, clients get real excited about that. Not only can they make the this information private and control it better, they also have that again that management tool in place. But it's also it could be set generationally. So so the the trust designs around your estate plan, as you could see from our previous podcasts and and this conversation today happen to be a very, very important part of the, the, the process of getting this right, or, or at least putting more options on the table for families to get it right. Again, most families don't understand the options they have. And we go back to that time and time again, uh, it, you, you don't know what you don't know. And yeah. so this is a, an educational process that walks our families through how do you really look at these documents appropriately and how do they have impact positively or negatively to my family. So that's, I don't, I don't want to be a psychiatrist here, but that's really how we look at these processes. It's not just about the document. What other issues do we have to address with changing those documents? So that, that's where we, we, we kind of start. So Michael, you want to go through some of the discussion we have with some families about that privacy issue? Uh, because a lot, a lot of the trust that we see pour out and doesn't become private anymore. 
as an asset to the family. You want to talk about that part of the process? Sure, I, I can touch on that. And I'd maybe just to first to take a step back, one of the, we, we've mentioned trusts uh, as a tool to avoid the probate process. And that's because trusts, and there are a couple different, well, there are a lot of different kinds of trusts, but both a revocable living trust and an irrevocable trust are both trusts that avoid the probate process. So if you own assets inside of those trusts, they avoid the probate process. So that's one way at least to get it into a, a privately administered regime. Now, to, to your point, Dad, we often, again, because we work generationally with families, if you have a privately administered trust, as an example, so let's say mom or dad, they, they pass away and they create this trust for future generations. And future generations have the ability to take assets out of that trust, or let's say the trust language distributes the assets out of the trust at a certain period of time. Well, now you've now brought those assets back into the personal ownership and the public domain of future generations. So mm. we've talked a lot in the in the past on prior podcasts on asset protection and how trusts can be can be useful tools from an asset protection standpoint. But this is another reason why trust can be valuable is because it keeps the family asset base in that privately um, privately administered regime for generations, if you so choose. So that's that's one thing that we typically see, again, in our audits that we try to um, advise our clients on. If that's a concern of theirs, they have another option. John, you brought up a a great and scary point that even like with with a trust, it can certain things can happen, and then that can become public again. So there's a lot of ins and outs, and obviously I don't know any of them. <laughs> so I'm here to learn just like the audience is. I guess the bottom line for me, Michael, is how do you avoid probate altogether? How can you truly make your situation private so that you don't have those issues? Yeah, well, like I said, having assets owned in trust when you pass away is is the the most secure way to, to, to do that. And one one challenge we often see and I've reviewed a lot of these, is we, you have what's called a pour over will. And a pour over will basically says, instead of, because again, a will is going to be filed in the surrogate court, so that's going to become a public document. Mm -hmm. But if the will essentially says, I leave everything to X family trust, well, that's all that's really shown. That family trust document then becomes a, a again, it's a private document. You don't have to be worried about that being public information. But what ends up happening is that assets are not owned in that family trust upon the person passing away. And so because they don't own the assets in the trust, then all the assets are still public information because you own them in your, in your estate, in your, in your probate estate. So the one way to avoid the, the probate and the public process is to transfer assets to a trust before you pass away. That's, that's perhaps the single biggest uh, way to avoid this public process. Gotcha. Yeah, I had a client years ago, Eric, that had a su substantial estate. Uh, he was out of Delaware, and he owned probably 42 properties, investment properties, i.e. real estate, from Florida all the way uh, up to New York. Oh, wow. And all, Yeah, it was, a, it, was a, it was a heck of a process to go through all the analysis of the, all, all the properties. But one thing was evident that each one of these states, upon the death of the client, all these states would have to probate that real estate separately. Oh my goodness! And it would have been—we estimated it would have been over three, four hundred thousand dollars just to have that done, as on an estimate basis. Because imagine all these properties scattered throughout these states. So one of the things we recommended to this client, as Michael just pointed out, we took all these assets, set up a Delaware trust, and moved all these assets under that trust. So upon the death of John, that was his name, the, it was out of his you know, public state, it was in trust already and private as heck. So, and it was, it saved three, $400,000 in cost to probate. So, so you could strategically look at these assets that you have in your family. If you have multiple assets at different states, you got to be careful. That's where Michael's point is, get them under one trust umbrella. Yeah. And if you think about just, just even, you know, outside of the financial side of that, that particular example, but can you imagine a, a you know, losing a family member is obviously a traumatic event. And now not only are you losing that family member, you're now adding this additional complexity of all this different, you know, probating in multiple states and you have to hire attorneys in different states. I mean, it can become a, a, just a nightmare on top of just obviously losing the family member and dealing with everything that comes along with that. So this is, again, you know, this is, this is an area that families have control over. It's, it's not 
something that takes a, a ton of time to do. You just have to make it a priority uh, and focus on it. But you can avoid a lot of these these headaches down the road just by doing a, a couple things today. Yeah, imagine if, if, if that was not structured properly and this gentleman passed away with 42 properties scattered throughout the East Coast and there was an executor managing his estate. Can you imagine the complexity that executor had to go through and the life he would live for the next few years to try to resolve all those issues? It would have been a tragedy. So these, so it's not only not, not only the structure, it's, it's who, who's going to be responsible taking care of all this stuff. So you want to make it easier for your trustee and executor to make sure these things are in place either through dialogue in the document that gives descriptive you know, how it's going to roll out or how it's going to be distributed, make it as clear as possible, but also making sure that uh, it's 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 probated or not probatable as a structure. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, in that particular example, just, you know, valuing the real estate is one thing that, you you know, 42 properties, you're going to have to get those values. Oh, so so that's, that's, that's not even, uh, you know, that's a kind of a part of that probate process, but that's a whole separate thing that you have to do, and, or at least that client would have had to do. Uh, if he didn't uh, transfer those properties to trust uh, before that. So, you know, that's really the 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 crux of this kind of probate conversation. Um, and another thing that comes up, if in this, fortunately for us, we don't have this a lot with the families that we work with, but if there is, let's say, a family who maybe wants to leave out a child, as an example, or a family member from from their estate plan, again, it being a public document, if you have that that language in your will, that person that you're disinheriting, as an example, could go down and see that will and could challenge that probate process or that estate administration because it's a public process. Mm -hmm. So having it in a privately administered trust ahead of time, you can you, you can avoid that because, again, it's a privately administered document. And if that party is not a part of that trust, then they don't have any rights necessarily to to look at that uh, that trust document and perhaps challenge it. There's obviously state laws that get involved in that, but generally speaking, that's another way. So again, we're fortunate we don't have to deal with that a lot, but if that is a, a part of the plan, these these trusts can become an important component to avoid that probate process. I mean, we're talking about protection all the way around, right? From, yes. from strangers and from family. <laughs> yep. I mean, let's be honest. It's like you said, you've got is, you know, somebody's just angry and they're, they're bitter and they want a little bit of revenge. And so they're going to go through this process and they family or not, it doesn't mean it's going to go smooth. Sure. I mean, the, you come, you come up with that with, let's say blended families, um, that, that issue can sometimes arise where you may want to have uh, a, se a separate privately administered trust that maybe only benefits one side of the family. As an example, there's a lot of different ways that you can design it, but you're right, Eric, the protection component of it is really one that, that we focus on, whether that's asset protection from creditors or strangers, or even from family members or people more close to the, more close to the decedent there in that case. Yeah. It, yeah. it gets complex. I mean, it, that's why these, this piece of the pie is critical you get it as right as possible because you're, you you take in a whole lifetime of work and creating wealth. And if you don't do that second part, it could be so disruptive to the family or you could lose it. And remember, we go back to that every third generation, people lose wealth because of these issues aren't addressed. The communication breaks down, uh, the lack of control breaks down, and it's just it just causes problems. I'm going to put you guys on the spot. We talked uh -oh. about the protection part of it. Let's go back to the example of the gentleman with all the properties, right? 42 properties in however many different states. Avoiding the probate part of it, avoiding, uh, you said that he would have to get each property assessed. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Right. I mean, that, that would have to be a part of that process if you're basically filing with the court what the value of that property was for the probate process. So spitball me a number. How much did you guys save him by, or, or how much could have been saved by, doing it using trusts to put all the property in and avoiding all of that. Well, I get, well, you used that three, four hundred thousand dollar number. And that was, uh, and that was a light estimate. estimate. I'll tell you why. Cause I didn't finish the topic. By the way, half of these properties had partners. Oh no. <laughs> Family relatives, partners with old friends. He had, he had, he had properties in Florida wow. that he has partnership with his brother who was not getting along with. So, so these things become, more complex as you dig deep. So to answer your question, it was probably on the light side, three to 400,000. It, it could have been a lot higher because legal fees are, are a variable and who knows how long it would take to get it uh, processed. 
And just, again, going back to the front end of it, all those properties had to be moved to this trust. But his shares were moved to the trust. His brother's shares stay at, stayed mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. So all that, you know, breaking up all these properties and making sure all the all the all the structure was done right was was costly up front. There were some legal fees involved, but it wasn't nowhere. It wasn't anywhere near it would have cost if it was a if it was a public issue upon his passing. Well, yeah. Then, yeah, then I, you've got the 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 fact that somebody might challenge something, right? If if it's public, you've got all these different properties. It, there could be somebody out there that's going to then challenge it. And how much more are you going to spend on attorney's fees? No offense to attorneys, Michael, but <laughs> they charge a lot of money <laughs> you know, yeah. for, yeah. for good services. I mean, but still it's uh, wow. I mean, you helped them avoid a ton. Yeah. Now the, 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 the pushback we sometimes get with, particularly with real estate and, and avoiding probate is, well, I have to, now I have to go down and file a new deed, right? Because you, I have to, transfer the title of that property to one of these trust vehicles to to uh, get it out of the probate pr- process. Mm-hmm. So yes, you have to do that. But if you look at it in the grand scheme of things, it's it's probably much more cost effective to do that than to uh, take years to solve the probate process and, and pay legal fees on the back end. Yeah. I, I'll tell you one more story. I have a family member right now that I'm that I'm involved with. It's my my wife's sister. And she had a boyfriend I'm going to tell you a short story. I promise I'll make it short. Uh, lived with his with this gentleman for about 15 years. Never got married. Um, he had a problem with his three children and left all the real estate to my sister-in-law. Hmm. Now, you can imagine the problem that caused. Uh, yeah. Everything was done legally. The will was done, but it wasn't private. Uh, it was public. And it went through this probate process. And I think the legal fees to date are at 100000 Wow. And it's not even it's not even halfway done yet because the kids are challenging the asset and the courts are 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 taking it through a, a, a process that's taking a long period of time. So as you can see, these things can happen routinely by accident and all of a sudden this big problem. And these and by the way, the real estate is not a small value of real estate. You're talking about some a property in Florida that's right on the water. Uh, a very expensive property, mm-hmm. and everybody wants a piece of the pie. And I get it. And the kids had technically have no right to it. But how courts look at this, well, they're his kids. Yeah. So yeah. There's, a, there's a challenge whether the court's going to take favor. In the meantime, my sister-in-law is carrying the mortgage, paying all the expenses, and carrying everything. And these kids are just saying, I want a piece. So it's a, it's a challenge. And I, I don't, I don't want to get into the weeds with some of these cases. But as you can see, errors can be made simply because you didn't know yeah. that you could do something different. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, not, not a good result in that, <laughs> in that instance. Uh, yeah, yeah. It relies on us for feedback. And I can't get involved with, obviously, all the details of it. But we, we support her as much as we can and help her through it. But uh, I can't control the three kids. That's going to be her issue. And the courts, it's really in the court's hands at this point. Okay, so look, you, you want to try to avoid. Let's just to take a quick look at this. If, if the situation was different, if they had come to you three, four years ago or before he passed, obviously, if, if he had come to you then, what would have been different? Right? Obviously, it sounds like the property would have gone into a trust. Yep, that that probably would have been the solution that would have it would have been a gift from his standpoint to her, right? Okay, so and and that would have made it it private a lot better. Yeah, that would have made it private, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, Well, and here and here's the way of looking at it too, Eric. If you do something during your lifetime, there's much more certainty with regard to what your intent was, right? So in that mm -hmm. will contest. It's a stronger argument to say, look, I, I'm doing this while I'm alive. I'm in control of it. I'm here. Uh, the, the courts, many courts would look at that and say, okay, well, the, he, he did that. He did that while he was alive. There's no ambiguity around it, having this language in a will in this particular example and him not being here, obviously, to tell us what his intent was, right? So there's that component of it as well, which is, again, you can be a little bit more proactive and, and provide a degree of certainty around what your intentions are by sometimes doing things while you're alive. So, okay, wait a second. The, the verbiage for a will and the verbiage for a trust, they're both done while you're alive, right? Mm-hmm. Correct. Yep. So, yep. so you're, what you're, what, what I'm hearing is that the court takes a trust more seriously than they take a will because the, a will should be what I'm, what I want, <laughs> right? I, right. I'm putting that in there, but so they take more, 
uh, they take a trust more seriously or they, they, it has more weight is what you're telling me. It can. Certain courts do. I mean, again, it is, it's very state specific. Every state has different uh, probate laws and, and the state administration laws. And so you have to really obviously talk to a qualified attorney in that arena, uh, to, to get the uh, prime example, or the, the, the actual law and how that would work. But Yes. I mean, wills are, you know, again, it's that they don't become legally effective until you've passed away. And so you can say, OK, my intent was uh, when I drafted this will that it was going to be X. But, you know, maybe that will's old or maybe the person had a conversation with the daughter after the fact. And they that daughter says, well, he intended to give it to me, but he just mm-hmm. never got his will redone. Right. So now, again, it's just a little bit more ambiguity with how that would all flow. And again, if you do something while you're alive, it just some, many courts will take that as being a more a, or a stronger position of what your intent was. Yeah, okay. my sister-in-law's case, Eric, it would have been a gift. So he would have had to take it, taken those assets and said, here, I'm going to gift these to you in trust. And that trust has a trustee other than my sister-in-law. Mm-hmm. So there's another third party involved that Got was it, yeah. intricate to the to the conversation, which would support the, the contention on on the asset. Absolutely. So it's like a witness, you know, and in the in the court's sure. eyes, in a way, it's a legal document, tax ID numbers, the whole ball of wax. It it strengthens your position. So that would have been a discussion if I would have known that. That would have been a discussion with my sister in law. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing I would say. Again, it's state specific, but nothing is is ironclad. I mean, there's always ways people could sue somebody right, for sure. anything, right? But mm-hmm. you know, again, there's just it's what's more of a secure position, and typically doing it while you're alive gives you a little bit more weight. Got in, it. In that example. All right. Is there anything else we need to cover today? We're running low on time in the podcast. This has been incredibly educational for me. A little scary in some parts, but uh, I know there's answers to those fears, so I appreciate that. Yeah, no, I think that's all that we wanted to cover today. Again, th- we, we chose this topic because it's, it's you know, again, a lot of our families, they, they, they say to us, well, I have an estate plan put in place. And they, and they do, but there's certain components of that estate plan that maybe they haven't gone far enough in looking at. And this mm-hmm. is one of those arenas, and that's why we wanted to talk about it today, because it, it typically comes up a, a lot when we look at uh, estate plans and we, when we review them. So that's why we wanted to cover it today. But yes, there are strategies that you can use if that's a concern of, of yours and the families. There are ways in which you can you can avoid that probate process. And my recommendation to anyone who's listening to this podcast is is take the next step, contact your attorney if you have one, if you don't find one, and and take take have them take a look at your current documents and ask them a question, how do I make this more private? And they'll be able to help them through a discovery and how they might want to accomplish that. And again, there's multiple options to do it, as we just talked about. But that's the recommendation I give anybody listening. Yeah, and if you have, just to add to that, if you have drafted a trust in your estate plan with your attorney and you have not t- retitled assets in the name of that trust, I would I would consult your attorney again to make sure that that gets done. Because again, you can have a trust, but if it's not funded, it doesn't necessarily avoid this probate process. So it's something you should talk to your, your advisors about. All right. I've got two things before we end this podcast. Number one, if somebody's listening and say, I do have an attorney, not sure if they're doing, uh, the things that you've spoken about on this podcast. I don't know if they're doing them correctly. I would like a second opinion. Uh, I'm assuming that they can reach out to you or if they don't have an attorney or they, they haven't even started this process and they like what they're hearing, how do they get a hold of you guys? Well, you can, you can go to, uh, our website, which is www.cbfgllc.com, or you can call us at area code 856-988-8300. All right. And John and Michael work uh, nationwide for those that are listening. Uh, and then the, before we end the podcast, I do want to give the, uh, the audience a sneak peek of what our next topic is. Cause you guys were talking to me about this before this podcast and I'm really excited. What is the next topic going to be guys? Yeah. Our, ne- our next uh, podcast is going to be family mission statements and uh, legacy letters for trusts, which is uh, again, we think generationally and these are very, very important tools uh, for long-term generational wealth preservation. So we're going to touch on that next. Buckle up. Yeah, it is a beautiful topic, and I can't wait to get into it with both of you. Thank you so much for your time today, guys. Thanks, Eric. Take care. You bet. And thank you all for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast with John and Michael Paris. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. 
This way, when John and Michael come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This also makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. And I would encourage you to do so because if you've got friends and family that could be in this situation where all their information could be very public, uh, you want you want to help them get that back to private so it's it's safer and they have the ability to to protect the family in that case. Again, thanks so much for listening today. For everyone at Copper Beach Financial Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Copper Beach Financial Group. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. This material is for informational purposes only. Neither APFS nor its representatives provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. Please consult your own tax, legal, or accounting professional before making any decisions. Securities offered through American Portfolio Financial Services Incorporated, APFS, member FINRA slash SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through American Portfolio Advisors Incorporated, APA, and SEC Registered Investment Advisor. Copper Beach is not affiliated with APFS and APA. Any opinions expressed in this forum are not the opinion or view of American Portfolios Financial Services Incorporated, APFS, or American Portfolios Advisors Incorporated, APA, and have not been reviewed by the firm for completeness or accuracy. These opinions are subject to change at any time without notice. Any comments or postings are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or a recommendation to buy or sell securities or other financial instruments. Readers should conduct their own review and exercise judgment prior to investing. Investments are not guaranteed, involve risk, and may result in a loss of principal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investments are not suitable for all types of investors.